What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Burke, aka Danzigweight here, and at this stage I never kind of thought I'd be saying this, but welcome to the final episode of this playthrough of Elden Ring, at least barring any DLC, because we have officially made it to the end. I've shown you guys everything I think that I can show you, um, I've explored as much as I can, I've defeated all the bosses I could find, um, I end up getting the Platinum Trophy as well, which is the first Platinum Trophy I've gotten in for as long as I can remember, probably since the Final Fantasy X 100% walkthrough that I did back in 2014. And so, for me at least, I am done with this game for now. I've done everything I want to do. Does that mean I did literally everything? Not even this time around with the Platinum Trophy, because this game just turned out to be just this incredibly huge and deep rabbit hole that even after like looking through some of the stuff and while doing the editing and chatting to my friends, there's still so much stuff I miss and that I never saw. It's actually insane. So um, all that remains at this point is for me to try to somehow kind of remember and talk about as much of a 150 hour playthrough as I can. And so this is going to be just like, a, again, a stream of thoughts and consciousness about Elden Ring and my experience with it and just trying to somehow summarize everything that I've experienced over the last few months. So buckle up because there's going to be a lot of talking here. Um, obviously, because the game is so huge, there's just so much to talk about. And I'll try to, of course, get through as many topics as I can because if you've already invested this much time watching this series, uh, my guess is that you probably want to take some time and just see how I feel about things overall having completed it. So let's get into it and review the experience and the game and wrap things up for this immense series before DLC happens. So, as always, I try to begin with the good with these kind of things because to me that's like the, especially if I've enjoyed a game so much, I like to start with the positive for sure. Um, I think, for me, it's kind of, it's hard to find details about this game now because it's it's been such a huge experience and it has been so long that all that I can sort of think about are more just general ideas and just general feelings about the game. And there's just no doubt that this is the most addictive game I've played in forever. It's It was so incredibly addictive. And just the amount of, the sheer amount of gears that this game had to go was like almost nothing I've ever seen. It was just absolutely insane. Once I got into it and I started to realize that this game was way more of a rabbit hole than I ever imagined. The map was way bigger than I thought. There was way more to do than I thought. And once that started happening, and once I started enjoying the game as well, it just it just became the game that just kept on giving. And there was always more to do. There was always more to see. There was always more kind of traps to fall into. And there was always just going to be that one more time where you went out in search of something and you end up going down this complete other rabbit hole, which is a phrase I've said a lot already, because for this game, it really is true. It is a rabbit hole kind of game. I mean, the amount of times in this playthrough where I was like, oh, I'm just going to go from A to B. And then during that pathway, I find something which deviates me off to like C, D, E, F, and G for so long that I forget what I was even doing. And then like eight hours later, I go back to, to what I was trying to do and go to point B. It's just that kind of game. And I'm sure there's, a, I'm sure there's big open world expansive games that get addictive like that before. But honestly... In terms of open world games, I don't think I've ever played anything like this in my life. Um, I did play Zelda Breath of the Wild, which definitely gave me some of that sort of giant open world, just pure gaming sort of addictiveness where all I wanted to do was just keep exploring, keep finding new areas, keep doing new things. But Elden Ring for me just took that to a, to a higher level because I think it's just the, the game style just appeals to me a little bit more than, than Breath of the Wild, which I also really enjoyed. But Elden Ring, I think, just appeals to my taste a bit more. So it just elevated that aspect of it to even more dizzying heights than Breath of the Wild did. Now, now I think what I appreciate most about this game is probably just the... It just feels like it's this designed with such pure, solid foundations and philosophy for, for an open world game. That, especially after taking months playing through and chatting to so many people... It could be friends that I was chatting to. I had one or two real life friends that were playing as well that we met up with over the period of time that I was playing through the game. There's people that I chatted to in the 24-7 stream. The general common theme is that this game really does have this knack of being able to appeal to almost everyone. It really is such an accessible game to so many different people. And that is something that definitely requires 
a really just sound foundational philosophy in how you design your game. I mean, a lot of it is just so deliberate and so well done that you can attract players that have never played a Soulsborne game before, that may be very daunted by how difficult the bosses are, and then you've got people like me that have started to dabble in it and that are wanting to experience it further, and then of course you have the veterans of the game. And to me, like nothing exemplifies that more than first the anecdotal evidence that I have from everyone I've spoken with and my own experience, but also the fact that this game sold insane amounts of copies. I think as of this point, it's like 13 million or 15 million or something. That is absolutely bonkers. Like if you look at like the sales of something like Bloodborne, yes, it was platform specific, but this game's sales and like the way it absolutely just crushed it in the sales, it got the critical acclaim, it got the sales, and it has the anecdotal evidence too, for me as well. So when I put all of this together, this, this all just points to the fact that this game really does have mastery in it, and it is a masterpiece for that reason. I mean, it's just hard for me to deny what this game has managed to achieve. And that core ability to just get everyone sucked into the game, get you exploring, and just get you to, to really experience and enjoy the world, and just, just keep going, just keep finding new things, fighting bosses, changing up your build, getting lost, finding stuff. It's just the way that it gets you to do that is like nothing I've ever seen before. It's just absolutely incredible. The main reason, obviously, I think that this is the case is just because it doesn't have the sort of bottlenecking design that a lot of the other games in Soulsborne do have. I mean, I remember with Bloodborne, yes, there was, of course, like an element of exploration and you could deviate from the path slightly, but it would never take too long before you came face to face with a boss and you didn't really know where to go. It was either like I defeat this boss and I make progress or I'm kind of stuck. I've got to maybe try to find a, a way around it or find a new area that I haven't seen. But by and large, there were a lot of occasions where you really had to just go like lock horns with this boss and make your way through it. And that, of course, is has its own merits. And there's a reason why Bloodborne is such an incredible game, too. So it's not to say that that's, a, that's poor design. But if the aim of your game is to have like an open world exploration thing where you really want all of the players to sort of embrace the ability to just explore and to, and to experiment and to try new things and find new areas and use different play styles, then not having this bottlenecking kind of design I think is really smart. I mean, I literally spoke to someone who said that they spent about 60 to 65 hours before they even fought Margaret. So I spent 150 on the entire run, which is already like above average. And this guy spent 60 just to get to Margit. And that doesn't mean that obviously it took him 60 hours because he was trying to get to Margit so hard that he couldn't do it for 60 hours. He just felt like exploring and doing other shit for 60 hours before he was like, okay, fine, let's just go and take on Margit. Having that kind of variation is just, is just excellent. So I think something even just as simple as not bottlenecking you with bosses and encouraging you to explore in that way was a massive key to this game's success. And it kept on going. It wasn't just like this one trick thing with Margit, but the way that they use Margit, I think, to train the player into thinking, look, okay, we've given you a few pointers on the general direction. You've got like the path of grace and all this kind of stuff. Sure, like you can try to follow that and see where it takes you, but you're going to find that it's going to take you to something very difficult that you are going to really struggle to, to defeat if you only follow that path. So the path kind of takes you to Margit, and you guys saw I met Margit pretty early. I was like level 13 or 14, and I think I was only like ele level 10 to start or something. So I barely made any progress before I got to Margit. And for me, because I had my sort of Bloodborne brain on, I was like, yeah, okay, this is a game saying you've got to get good, you've got to do 200 attempts even on the first boss. This is like a Soulsborne, like difficult game. We've we got to play it this way. And you guys saw, I just got beat down. And the game wore me down and trained me through Margit to not play like that and to, to actually make use of this giant map that's been given to you and to get out there and explore and to increase my levels, to find new items, to find new weapons, to find new armor, to find new spells, to find new incantations, whatever the hell it might be. Go and do all of that stuff. Enjoy. Build up your character, build up your skills, then come back and try again when you're ready. And so I was like the, the quintessential example, I think, of what the game was trying to achieve with that. And I'm so glad that it went that way because that first like 20 hours or so really trained me into a style of play that ended up serving me really well. That just kept on going. I mean, when I talk about like the amount of gears this game has, 
what really blew my mind was when I started to get to like 60, 70, 80, 90 hours, and it felt like the game was still going up a gear. That's what truly started to blow my mind. Like even after you've played a game for so long, the fact that you can still get lost, still find new areas, not be OP and find bosses that can completely wipe you out, even when you think that you're high level and that you've got to a stage where, yeah, okay, I, I figured this game out now. I should be able to get through the rest of it more easily because I've done so much leveling up and my weapon is this level and I've already got 80 hours of experience under my belt. I've been, I've been having an easy time the last 10, 15 hours. I think that, that this is going to be the road towards the end of the game. And then, no, it's like you find a new area where you're getting crushed and you, you find an entire new part of the map that you didn't know existed. And so the game continues shifting through gears even after that much time. And there's just so few games, basically almost none that I've ever played, that after that length of time still has gears to shift. That was just mind-blowing for me. I think that's where I really started to be like, okay, this game is just something ridiculous. And this really manifested in the way that I end up recording the LP because my plan was to try to do this and Horizon Forbidden West together because my assumption was that both games together would take me about 100 hours to do, like 100, 110 hours tops. And so that was the intention. And then I began. And well, normally it was supposed to be the case that I would finish Forbidden West first because the game came out about, I think, like 10 days earlier or a week earlier or something. And I'd already made about 30, 35 hours of progress. And I thought, yeah, I can just finish that. Uh, just record enough Elden Ring to have the episodes flowing, and then I can focus fully on Elden Ring. But that's not what happened. Basically, Elden Ring, I got so hooked into it that I didn't go back to Horizon Forbidden West until I completed Elden Ring. And so that was like a testament to, to how much it took over my time and how addictive it was to play. And it wasn't the, the kind of addictiveness that I think... It's hard to explain, but I feel like some games almost artificially induce addictiveness. Um, I couldn't really explain to you how, but I think a lot of you guys would know what I mean, where some games are addictive, but you kind of come away from it feeling like you were almost kind of tricked into being addicted to it. But Elden Ring's addictiveness just felt so organic to me that it absolutely just, just drew me in. I mean, I look at the sessions, and normally when I'm recording LP content, because I'm commentating all the time, and uh, it's, it's just generally a bit more mentally taxing to, than just playing it completely in your own time. Usually after three to four hours, maybe four and a half hours, I'm usually done and I don't want to continue recording because I start to notice like my, the quality of my LP and dipping once I start to record sessions that are too long and I start to tire myself out. Elden Ring didn't have that. Like The amount of excitement I felt while playing the game most of my sessions were between like five and six hours. I had the majority of my sessions were over five hours long and I had a bunch that were like six, six and a half hours as well. That was just like, if you just look through those stats as well, it just speaks for itself. The extent to which I got hooked into this game was, was like pretty much nothing else that I've ever played. So, I mean, those are the facts. And so that singular, very general aspect of the game is probably still what made it the most special for me in terms of my experience of playing through. So, of course, another aspect of why I found the game so brilliant was that, as I've said as well, the game almost feels like a choose-your-own-adventure kind of experience. And so it has this sort of uncanny ability for everyone's micro-experience of the game to be very different. But then the macro-collective experience is actually a lot more similar. And so this game, like when I first got into it, um, I started to strategize about how I wanted to play. And of course, I was fearful of the fact that this is a Soulsborne game, this is going to be difficult, you know, you're going to be dying a lot and all that kind of stuff. And the, the reputation that the Soulsborne series has. And so I obviously adopted a much more kind of careful approach. I was using a lot of the crouching, a lot of the, the sneaking around. I had a long range spell to, to try to take people out with. I had, I had my own style that I started developing. And for me, that was really fun because I, I felt like I had some agency over how to tackle the game as opposed to the game telling me look man this is how you have to play this game uh, let's say for example you have to use one of three weapons like bloodborne at the start uh, you have to use one of three weapons you don't have a shield um, you just gotta get good you just gotta dodge at the right time you gotta attack at the right time blah -de blah -de blah and with this game i felt like i had way more control eventually yes like once the game starts to get more difficult it does come down to to some of those aspects a lot more 
but the sheer amount of build variety that you can have in this game is just tremendous. The, whenever you talk to people again, it's one of these things where, especially if you're watching, especially if you're chatting to people that are also doing blind runs, you ask them, like, so, you know, what weapon are you using? Uh, what spells are you using? What incantations are you using? What are your stats looking like? What are, what's the distribution? You rarely ever get the same answer twice. Like, okay, you might have, let's say, of every 10 blind runners, you might have two or three of them that go for dual katana bleed builds, for example. But in general, the variety is just so large that it makes conversations about the game very interesting as well. And so, for me at least, one of my favorite aspects is I've always been a, a challenge type player. I enjoy doing things that, at least for me personally, that I find a bit more difficult and that require experimentation and figuring things out. And so Elden Ring caters to that so beautifully, it really goes hand in hand again with my own personal taste. So in my earliest experiences, of course, of doing challenges for anyone who knows the channel beyond just maybe the series is, of course, Final Fantasy X. And one of the things that, that I loved the most about getting into challenges for Final Fantasy X was the way that players in the past, and well, me when attempting the challenge, you see something that seems difficult or even insurmountable, but what you do is you make use of all of the tools the game has given you in a way that allows you to defy the odds. And Elden Ring does this beautifully with a completely different style of game to Final Fantasy X. And again, this is exemplified a lot by the challenge runs that people have done already in such limited amounts of time. Like, the amount of different ways in which you can complete this entire game with all of the most difficult bosses being defeated, again, it's just mind-blowing because you play it and you think, okay, this is a Soulsborne game, you know, you can just have like a, a big sword, get, get good at dodging, use your sword, job done. And yeah, of course that works, but you've just got, you've got people that can like, I don't know, I'm trying to think now. I've, I've seen a f like so many ridiculous uh, challenges already that I'm struggling to literally remember them at this point. There's a YouTuber called Bushy and he's done like 10 different weird ones already. He's done one where it's like, uh, can, I beat, um, can I beat the game by just using my mouth? So like incantations and spells that involve some kind of roars and screams and shit. Uh, you have people like, I'm going to win with only using magic. I'm going to have people win only using... I don't know, dragon incantation or some shit. Like, there is just so many different ways to beat the game and so many different ways to solve problems and issues with bosses that you're facing. And so just, the, again, the sheer amount of experimentation and variety that the game allows was something that was really cool. And yes, of course, when you're playing it through, you do settle into finding what you like best. But there are times when you switch it up or you find something new that you weren't aware that worked so well previously. And so the way that you can adapt your play as you go, like for example, in my run, it was a lot more kind of hybrid magic and melee at the start. Then eventually I transitioned into using way less magic and I started to find weapons whose abilities I enjoyed more. So it became a bit more of a classic, like using weapons with nice abilities and a shield. Then I started to use things like Scarlet Rot and incorporated that into the more difficult bosses. And so as time goes on, you just find more and more things to, to help you in your run. And that, again, is just a, an aspect, I think, of what makes it so cool. The fact that you can basically choose your own adventure. You can go whichever direction you want in most cases. So, again, any two people on a blind run would have found the different areas at different times. The way that the NPCs are scattered around in their quest lines, uh, it does have some negatives too, which I'll mention later. But it also results in those experiences being pretty unique. So the NPCs that you stumble into... Uh, the order in which you find them is going to be unique to your run as well. And the list just goes on. You know, the catacombs you find, the order that you fight the bosses in. It really is a situation where everyone's experience is going to be different. But somehow, the general consensus is that it comes together in a way that everyone really enjoys. And that, to me, is again, it's just, it's just an indication of a masterfully made game. Something I think that also made the game very special for me is that it felt like so much more of a community experience than most things I've ever played before. Now, I'm the kind of guy that, of course, is known best for the Final Fantasy content. And so if a new Final Fantasy game comes out, of course, we're chatting about it. Um, and of course, because I've gotten to know a lot of people from the community, let's say when Final Fantasy VII Remake came out and we were all playing it, of course, there was an element of like chatting to people about your experience and, and whatnot. But for Elden Ring, it was literally like two or three months 
of just constant back and forth with other people who were playing the game, discussing our experiences, what were we facing, what were the difficulties that we came across, what were we enjoying, which NPCs did we find, which quest lines were we doing, and just this general kind of community and collaborative aspect of Elden Ring was something that I enjoyed so much because I had played Bloodborne and once I did that, um, it was I think it was two or three years after it was released, you definitely get to see that there's a very passionate Soulsborne fan base to the extent where, of course, you know, there are going to be toxic aspects of it, like any fandom, unfortunately. But there are a lot of dedicated people out there who really enjoy the series. Uh, they want other people to get into it and they want to share their experiences and be like collaborative and communicative with their fellow players. And so because Bloodborne it was just so beloved and I ended up enjoying the game so much, when Elden Ring came out, I was like, I really want to get in on this day one. I want to enjoy that kind of that journey with the rest of the community as the game ends up being played for the first time. Bosses get fought for the first time. Infamous bosses emerge. You start to talk about the lore and get more interested in that kind of stuff. I wanted to experience that journey. And Elden Ring delivered on that front like in a massive, massive way because the game is so huge and it's choose your own adventure so your motivation to talk to people about what they're doing and ask them questions and to listen to their experiences is so much greater than a lot of other experiences like if it's a linear game you just say so you know how far in are you and they'll say we're at point x and you're like okay cool but with elden ring it's like they could be off in a completely different direction doing different things they could have unlocked three maps that you've never even seen before and they could have fought 15 20 different bosses even though you're both 60 hours into the game. And so that aspect of it was just so fun. And the amount of conversations I've had about this game since it, since it released, and I still continue to have all this time later, is again something that makes this game very memorable and special for me. So I want to give a special shout out to uh, my moderators and friends, Psych and Indubitable Wordsmith, and also KH Mixer X. Uh, those three guys specifically, they were playing uh, Elden Ring pretty much alongside me. And we just spent an endless amount of time, um, both like individually and at least me, uh, Wordsmith and Psych, the three of us within the moderator group, we made our own channel for Elden Ring. And it was just endless conversations and talk about the game. And it was so much fun and it was really cool to, to hear about their experiences and what they were up to as well. And so that kind of community aspect and uh, the communicative aspect of Elden Ring was something that was just really cool. And it continues to grow every day because of course, one of the other very interesting aspects of games like Elden Ring, um, the FromSoft franchise, is the lore and the way that the story is presented. Now, I think for me in general, if I had to give it an overall view, for my own personal tastes, it's more of a negative than a positive. But the positive aspect of it is that when you are done playing, you can really get into a lot of the, the lore of the game that you completely missed, connections you never made, things that you, you never even saw, you never even acknowledged. There is just so much of it in this game, and Elden Ring is no different. Um, these guys are already masters of this type of storytelling and world building and lore. And of course, they had George R.R. R. Martin on board as well to help with the world building and that kind of thing. So obviously, once everything was done, and I started getting into, of course, the Varty video videos, um, if you don't know Varty, then uh, I'm, I have no idea how that's possible, given like how huge he is in the community. But he pretty much, for me at least, makes far and away the most quality Elden Ring content on YouTube. And uh, watching, like binging through his, his lore videos for these Soulsborne games is always so eye-opening and fascinating. And it almost feels like you just you didn't even play the same game. Like he, The way he goes through stuff... Um, of course, it's a very, again, collaborative thing. It's not like he's sitting down and figuring out all the law by himself. It's a whole community of people. But he's a great presenter of the information, and I'm sure he contributes hugely to the research as well. But in any case, like, you watch it, and, you know, he talks about, let's say, the death right birds, and, you know, the, the traditions of, of how, of what happens to, to people after they die uh, before the time of the Erd tree and how death right birds were involved and like the white black flame that they have and it's just like for me death right bird was just a boss i met one time that looked pretty cool and was difficult to beat and i was like okay that's cool death right bird clearly it has something to do with death it's very strong it probably kills people or whatever like you just you just defeat the boss and you move on 
but with these games, like the amount of stuff under the surface and the amount of connections that you can put together, if you're willing to put in the effort yourself, or like me, you want to watch the fruits of the community's labor through people like Varty, it's incredibly rewarding and it really does add another dimension to the game. And so it is something that I do always enjoy about games like Elden Ring and Bloodborne, but overall I would still say it's not my favored method of storytelling personally. It doesn't mean I don't enjoy and appreciate that kind of stuff, especially after the playthrough is done and I get time to, to research and enjoy it myself. Continuing on from the storytelling aspect, another reason why I think it's strong is because, especially for a game like Elden Ring, the fact that you don't have like a pressing ongoing story or like a, a massive investment in the characters and their stories and what's happening, it really frees you up to continue to do that exploring and experimentation and traveling that the game is so great at allowing you to do. And so, again, for Elden Ring, that's why for me it's a, it's a positive aspect as well. Um, and it's, it's undeniably something that's very helpful for the game and it's something that deserves praise. The fact that, for me, one of the things I always struggle with the most with open world games is knowing when to deviate from the main story path and when to stick to it. And for me, I can never, I can never quite find the right balance. It's always a case of, well, if I just do the main story, I get the story momentum that I want and the pacing, and that's great. But then, of course, it's always a, well, you missed like, this storyline, you missed that storyline, this side quest, okay, it didn't contribute to the main story, but it was really fun, you should have seen it. And so you lose something from the experience. So then I'm like, okay, then if I end up doing every single side quest when it becomes available, then there's going to be crappy side quests. There's going to be side quests that you think are interesting but turn out to be shit. There's going to be like fetch quests. There's going to be stuff that affects pacing. And you're potentially going to be OP for the rest of the story if you do all of the side quests and gain all of the experience and the items and the equipment as you go. So for me, finding that balance between the two is always very hard. And so it's always like I have to try to make my mind up where I'll do like story for a few hours and I'll try to find a natural kind of jumping off point where I can say okay let's do some side quests now and so sure like I can I can generally figure it out and have a really good time but with a game like Elden Ring that's a non-factor I don't have to think about that at all it's just always about finding the next place and exploring the next thing or just picking something to do and just going for it and that again it really adds to that addictiveness aspect because I don't have to worry about well, I mean, should I do this bit or that bit because I want to see what's happening next in the story? I don't have to think about that. I can just go wherever the hell I want. If I'm on a detour, then I don't care because it's fun and I'm discovering a new area. I wonder what boss is going to be at the end of this. Am I going to get a cool new weapon or a cool new armor? Will I meet an NPC? And so this kind of attitude continues on for the entire run. And the fact that the story is so minimal and so in the background while still retaining depth if you want to go look for it again is something masterful so the fact that i still consider it more negative than positive is going to sound strange at this point because i've praised it so much but again i'm looking at it from a completely personal perspective and i'll get to that when i start talking about the things i didn't enjoy as much but hopefully by acknowledging the the very obvious and important strengths of the storytelling style for elden ring especially that I think when I get onto why it's still negative, it's gonna make it's gonna make a bit more sense. It's not just gonna be me trying to, to trash the game. Okay, so I think now it's time for me to get into some more of like the, the standard kind of specific things as opposed to talking about these kind of general general feelings and, and more macro ideas. Um, gameplay. The gameplay for me was really fun. It was really, really good. Again, I think mostly because of the variety. The the variety the sheer different number of like Ashes of War you could have and the spells and the different play styles I think really did appeal. Uh, it made you feel like you had options, you could test out different things and you could find things that worked for different bosses. And again, if for more experimental type players that maybe have a bit more of a challenge kind of brain, um, when something is difficult, trying to, to do something a little bit different sometimes and having that work can be a lot of fun. So let's say, I don't know, you're fighting a boss and you realize that you have a weapon which has an ability 
that serves you well in this particular battle. And so you change your weapon uh, and you find something that works better and you end up winning the battle. Like that can be really satisfying for, for everybody. Again, I think the variety just really does shine. It's got its core mechanics, of course, and by and large, you know, there are always going to be those fundamental kind of gameplay aspects that we all have to abide by. But I think in general, that was already pretty solid. And it's something that many of us are either used to or you get used to pretty quickly. But then being able to, to branch off in so many different ways while retaining those core fundamentals of the gameplay I think was uh, was something that was really cool. So I don't have too much to, to say about it because I think if you're like a, a Soulsborne veteran that's been playing you know, since Demon Souls days and you've seen how FromSoft has evolved its gameplay, maybe you can comment a bit more on how it's different and how like mechanically things have changed or maybe like you could say, I don't know, oh, in Dark Souls 3 you had XYZ, which was a better mechanic than what they have in this one. But I'm not going to approach it from too like mechanical and technical perspective. I'm going to try to keep things a bit more surface level and just talk about the fact that, like, in general, fundamentally, I think it was, it was good gameplay and it was fun. Um, it, they kept it relatively simple. It wasn't too difficult to understand. Like, one of the, the main fundamental things, of course, was something like, let's say, equipment load. And so if you're not used to it, like for example, as a Bloodborne player, that was never a factor for me. And so it took me a while to understand that I was fat rolling and that I need to go down to medium load. But I did get there in the end. And well, for like, I would say 90% of the game, like 85, 90% of the game, I knew what the deal was with that. And it definitely affected the gameplay experience once I did figure it out. So there are, of course, going to be aspects like that for, for newer players things that you have to get used to, but I do think it's not that difficult to grasp. And with, again, the sheer variety of things available, it allows players to choose their own adventure and find their own playstyle and whatever works for them. Extending further, I think, again, another reason why the game is so strong and why it keeps kind of adhering to this central, almost Erdtree-like philosophy of exploring and enjoying the world is because the game gives you so many options for people who might be struggling against a particular boss. So again, off the top of my head, there's just let's just say you're having a tough time um, and you, you need to defeat a boss. What can you do? You can explore to find better equipment. You can find better spells. You can find better armor, potentially. You can find items that could be useful to you. So just purely getting out there and exploring and finding more effective stuff is one thing. Two very easy to just go explore and during that exploration process you can naturally gain more levels and become stronger so you don't really need to grind you can just explore and just enjoy the game and you'll organically and naturally raise your levels so that when you do come back from your exploring you're more able to win so that's another thing the game has a bunch of status effects which are pretty useful i mean we all saw what bleed could do in this game you saw there's things like poison there's scarlet rot which is hugely effective I never really realized this in the playthrough, but using the crafting, you can even craft sleeping pots and put some of the enemies to sleep. So there's state effects that can help you. If you're having trouble with melee, you can go for a bit more of a magic heavy build. And especially once you start to get to like the higher levels of intelligence and faith, you can start to get some really broken and OP spells that can dispatch bosses pretty damn easily. You've got the physics you can mix, you've got ashes of war that you can put onto your weapons. Then, of course, you have the summons that are available to you. So either you've got like your Mimic tier or there's a there's like an Ender Suite of summons that can help you. You've got the game's NPC summons. So you can summon, I don't know, like Nefeli. You can summon Blythe. You can summon Millicent. You can even summon Melina. Like there's, there's just a whole bunch of NPC summons that you can use to help make life easier. And then, of course, you even have online play as well, where you can just bring in players from online to help you hopefully defeat a boss too. Like, the sheer amount of different options available to you makes it so that the odds of you getting completely and utterly stuck somewhere where you can absolutely make no progress and you also have nowhere left to go to explore to do something else instead is basically zero in this game. And again, for me, that's a massive strength. And it, again, it all serves that central purpose that the game has, in my opinion, which is about that exploration and that journey through the lands between. So, of course, we can't talk about Elden Ring without talking about the bosses. And for me, I think the bosses were... Ooh, I think overall they were, they were definitely positive. They were very good. Um, but there are definitely some caveats, I think, for, for me personally to do with some of the bosses. 
and some of like the approach to bosses, I guess. Um, I would say, like I mentioned before, I think Margit is a fantastic, like first story boss. I think a lot of the, I think a lot of people playing the first like major major boss they encounter is probably Margit. I think he was designed brilliantly, especially for the majority of us that probably couldn't defeat him the first time we got there, and it, it kind of trained us to to get back out there and to and to not be afraid to kind of turn away and keep exploring and keep getting better. Uh, keep expanding your inventory and then coming back and trying again when you're stronger and more ready to make progress. So I think that was definitely really cool. Um, if I have to talk about standout, because there's just way too many bosses, I, I'm not, I'm not going to get too specific here. Um, I think... I actually thought um, Renala and Gideon were two particularly good bosses for me personally because... I do feel like magic was a bit underutilized in the game from a boss perspective. So having those two that gave you a different kind of challenge uh, with their powerful magic spells, like relative to their levels, I think was a, was a memorable addition. I did enjoy that. Uh, the Renala battle was definitely cool for me. Uh, the, the arena as well. Like the first time you go into the library was, was a bit confusing, trying to figure it out. And then you had like the, the moon backdrop and the water and everything. A bit reminiscent of Rom for me in um, in Bloodborne, the, the arena. But yeah, I thought that was actually pretty cool. Um, depending on your levels and stuff, she can be a bit of a pushover. But for me, because again, I got to Rhea Lucaria fairly early. She was a tough boss. And the magic-centric nature, I definitely think, uh, made her cool as well. And Gideon had every trick, trick in the book. So he was a bit of a surprise compared to all like the big badass bosses with like massive axes and shit that you're fighting so i do wish there was a, there was more so it's a little bit of a spoiler into the kind of negative aspects of the bosses but uh, again we'll focus on the positive for now um i loved astor the first time i saw astor i was like shook again the arena was amazing the colors the design um everything was really cool about astor now the second astor battle was complete bullshit um, and again, I'll get into that later, but the first Astral Battle that I encountered was super cool, and it was a standout for me. Uh, Deathrite Bird, as mentioned, I later found out I think there's four Deathrite Birds. I encountered the third one of the four in terms of difficulty, and honestly, I'm kind of glad they only encountered one out of four, but um, that was really nice. It, because it, I only encountered one, to me, during this experience, it was a unique boss design. Uh, had a great time fighting it, was difficult, uh, managed to defeat it without summoning, but was still like a challenge and had a unique design with the Black Flame. So it was definitely a cool one. Uh, Maliketh, that Form 2 transition was just so epic. And the moves that it had was absolutely insane. Um, if Maliketh had like 50% more HP, I think I would have been stuck on Maliketh for a long time and potentially needed to summon. But my only reprieve was that Maliketh didn't have as much uh, HP. So I kind of got away with that. Uh, Godfrey Horalu was was definitely a cool transition. We got to see like the golden version, and I remember thinking like, when is this guy going to pop up? And so like that battle, I definitely think was pretty cool. And it was like a it was a pretty kind of classic battle because he didn't have like a massive array of moves or anything like that. And so like it was a bit more of a classic one, but it was it was it was good. I did enjoy that one. Um, I would say one or two of the dragons were definitely super cool, and Placidusax at the end, like the, the, the daddy of all the dragons, that was a heck of an arena and a heck of a boss. I do wish I encountered it the first time I got to Faramazula, but it was such a, a shitty, like, difficult one to unlock and find that I just, I wouldn't have been able to do it without a guide, and so I was a little bit OP for it, but it was definitely a memorable battle regardless, it was really cool. Radan, of course, has to go down as one of my favorites because he was so notoriously difficult. The, the Giga Chad himself. Uh, he was one of the very few bosses in the game where I gave it everything without summons. But honestly, the battle was so fun with the summons that I really... I have absolutely no regrets about that one, uh, doing it with summons. Like, I have no like wish to go back and solo it in a particularly strong way. I feel like that really was the way that battle should have been won. And so I have no regrets. It was a really fun one. And of course, who can forget that meteor attack the first time that you see it or you don't see it and it wipes you out. It was, it was absolutely epic. And so I did love the, the Radan battle, despite how difficult it was to try to solo. Then, of course, you have my two nemeses, Moog and Melania. They were extremely difficult, but memorable because of how tough they were for me. Uh, Moog was like a, a really nice battle, I think. It was just 
it was really nice and it was just purely kind of too hard. Uh, the Nihil move does feel gimmicky, uh, I will admit, but given enough practice, um, I guess you can kind of just learn to to time it correctly so that you just use your Crimson Flasks, and you, ha you do have to sacrifice three of them, but I guess if you do get good enough eventually, that shouldn't be a problem. But that bit did feel gimmicky, but it's such an epic attack, and so different to anything else that you face, I kind of give it a pass. And of course, like the rest of the battle, uh, with the challenge and like the... He does instill that fear in you. At least for me, he did uh, when I started fighting him. And I, I just... I couldn't even overcome him without summoning. So uh, Moog was definitely very cool with the Blood Flame. And Melania... I have to respect how difficult Melania is. Um, because of how open the game is and how many options you have to win in the game, there aren't that many bosses that are like complete roadblocks to, to get through. Uh, you guys saw in the playthrough a lot of the roadblocks I encountered it was by design. Um, like Radan, for example, I could have saved myself like 40 attempts if I just started summoning immediately. With Margie, I was just a little bit stubborn about the extent to which I wanted to, to go back and level up, but he could have definitely been defeated a lot quicker. And uh, and Moog, again, if I summoned earlier, then he would have died. But I feel like Melania, um, even if I summoned quite early on, the reason Melania died pretty quickly after I started summoning was because I had so much groundwork in the first place. And so... The, the difficulty of Melania was definitely like a boss that was needed in the game. There had to be at least one like truly standout difficult boss that despite your build or whatever you were doing, most people were going to struggle the first time they fought Melania. And so Melania was definitely the boss where um, the people that I spoke to during my playthrough, none of them were like, oh, uh, Melania was fine. I just, uh, I soloed her in like five attempts, it was easy. I didn't hear anyone say that about Melania, regardless of build or level or anything like that. So I do respect uh, Melania in that sense, and it definitely made her infamous and memorable. So yeah. Um, then I guess maybe of like the, the lesser bosses, the Crucible Knights, the Sentinels I did mention, to me they're just classic, simple, but really good bosses. And their second forms with the wings and stuff was really fun as well. And they are like a, a quintessential, like get good kind of boss. And I, I did enjoy that. So, yeah, I did like those guys. The Godskin guys were pretty cool too. Um, especially as a duo when they appeared. Like, they were they were definitely pretty formidable. And again, I think the Black Flame is just so cool in this game. That seeing enemies that utilize them, I think, was especially cool. And they have pretty cool boss music as well. So, I did um, I did, I did enjoy the, the Godskins as well. So that this video isn't literally like six hours long. I, if I start to try and talk about like the balancing and the difficulty, I'll be here all day. All I will say is that, again, it's a double-edged sword um, in that sense. You really do kind of, because it is such a choose-your-adventure game, to me it really ended up feeling like a choose-your-own-difficulty kind of game, um, where if you do have some base level of ability that I think a large majority of the of the player base would have, it's not about like being super skillful or, or good at the game, it really does start to come down to to what extent do you want to use the almost infinite number of tools the game gives you to defeat a boss? And so you have to kind of find your own challenge within those boundaries. So again, the, the summoning one is one of the most basic, easy ones. You have to make a choice. Do I use online summons? Yes or no? Do I use NPC summons? Do I use the mimic tier? And so you have to kind of make these decisions as you play. And so it can affect the game in a massive way. If, let's say, you were the kind of person that loved to grind, loved to be OP, you love to research and find all of the exploits that you can find for the game. So, you know, I don't know, what is the best way to get bleed damage or scarlet raw, all of these kind of things. And you combine every single trick that you can find while researching. I'm pretty sure someone of very average skill would pretty much be able to defeat every boss in this game and it would overall be like a 3 out of 10 difficulty kind of game. Because even against like the absolute toughest of bosses, if you're summoning and you're using every trick in the book, they're not that hard. So in that sense, it's like, a, if you found the game too easy, it's kind of your fault. And if you found the game too hard, it's also kind of your fault. So that's why you really do, it is a very individual experience and you have to find your own challenge. And obviously that is a, that is a double-edged sword. So. I will say, like, it, it did end up being a bit easier than I expected. I did feel like I'd face more bosses where, despite summoning, let's say, you still couldn't really get through, or any other kind of tricks, let's say, bleed or scarlet rot or whatever it might be. I did expect a few more bosses to, to kind of 
wipe me out even if I did use my tricks. So I would say it was slightly on the, the easier end of the spectrum than I expected. I would say the difficulty for non-bosses was pretty fine. I didn't really have any problems with that. Um, and a lot of my deaths were just generally exploring and finding new areas and fighting like new smaller enemies and, and that kind of thing. That was actually fine. Um, I don't really recall having too much issue with that. But the bosses themselves, um, those singular battles, I would say that they were on the easier end of the spectrum. And I did find that there were a fair few occasions where I was kind of pushing myself to make it harder deliberately to, to have a more satisfying win in the end. So, yeah, when it comes to the difficulty thing, I would say that that was my general feeling. It did have its challenging moments, of course, and it did have a big spectrum because it's such a huge game. But if I had to take an average, I would say it was slightly below average to, to what I was expecting in terms of its difficulty. So to try and start wrapping things up, I want to talk about like the art design and the visuals of the game. I'll be honest, when I first kind of fired it up and, I f and the first footage I saw, I was like, I have literally just been playing Horizon Forbidden West. If you're talking about like a pure visual quality standpoint, this game, to me at least, it feels far inferior to Horizon Forbidden West. And so it was a little bit of a shock. I'm like, wait, these are both games on the PS5 and PS4. And Horizon Forbidden West does look like it's like half a generation ahead of Elden Ring. And so that was a little bit of a disappointment at the start. Um, obviously, there's no like 4K 60 FPS as well. Um, you have to go down to like some kind of 1440p uh, mode in order to get 60 FPS. And so, you know, the it wasn't like the, the technical and visual marvel that I quite expected. But, but, once I actually started playing the game and I started to find new areas, I started to explore more, my eyes adjusted to like the general look of the game because obviously coming off the back of 35 hours of Forbidden West was a little bit unfair on Elden Ring um, because they're just like, they're, they're on different, I think they're trying to achieve different things visually. So it was a bit unfair, but at the end of the day, your eyes see what your eyes see. And I did need a little bit of time to adjust to the visuals of Elden Ring. But I would say after like 10, 15 hours maybe, 20 hours, I started to really adjust to it and I started to really see a lot more of the beauty in the game. And of course the art design. And even like right now, some of the backdrops in this game are truly, truly gorgeous. And um, I remember like the first time I went down to the Siofra area, absolutely stunning. I'm, a, I'm always a sucker for like night sky stuff. And seeing that kind of artificial night sky uh, below the surface and like those like reddish nebula gas clouds and stuff, it was just so, so beautiful. And again, the variety in the areas I thought was really nice. Uh, even like Limgrave, Kaelid and Leonia, they're all so different to each other. And of course, then you go on to like the mountaintop areas and then you've got like the snowfields, you've got like the Lake of Rot, so you've got the cities, like the, the capital, of course visually I end up really enjoying this game and I think the art design is really beautiful so even though initially it was like a little bit of a underwhelming kind of feeling by the time I got to the end it actually turned into a strength of the game and I really did enjoy the visuals um, I think like the boss designs are pretty cool there's a nice like variety in the amount of different things that they put in the game uh, smaller more humanoid looking bosses then you had like the giant humanoid looking bosses like even Radan he's he's absolutely huge but like his design is, is very interesting and very intimidating. And then you've got everything ranging up to the fire giant and then you've got the godskin guys with like their interesting like the the faces on their armors and that kind of thing. There was a really nice variety, I think, in the end, and I did definitely I did end up appreciating the visuals a lot. And of course again, if you are making a game that is this big and that relies this heavily on exploring, you better try and make it look good. And just having the pure visual fidelity is not enough. You really gotta be on point with your with your design and your environments to keep people engaged for this amount of time and in that sense i think they they did a wonderful job for a vast majority of the game visually so i think i've got to wrap up the the good stuff at this point it's just that there's just too much to talk about with this game there really is i could probably ramble on for another like three hours just about this side of things but um i'm gonna i'm gonna head over to some, to some of the stuff that i didn't like as much because those are definitely worth talking about too Okay, here we go. If you are the kind of person that believes this game is absolute perfection, 100 out of 100 masterpiece, and I will die on this hill forever, then you're about to be upset. Because, yeah, I do think the game is a masterpiece. 
but I don't think I've ever had a masterpiece game where I've ever had so many small issues. But somehow, everything that I'm about to mention from here on out didn't add up to, to not make this basically a 10 out of 10 game for me. If I'm on a 100 scale, I'd probably knock it down to like, I don't know, 93 to 95, something along that range. But like 10 scale, 9 point, like there's so few games that are worthy of a 10 in my opinion that all things considered, I, I think I have to give this game a 10 still. So even though the scaling doesn't completely make sense, like I, th I feel like 93 out of 100 sounds better than 9.3 out of 10, if that makes sense. So yeah, you get what I mean. But like any game, it's not 100 out of 100. So let me talk about, for me at least, why that's the case. Single biggest issue, I would say, for me, would be it did suffer from a quantity over quality problem in some areas. Yes, everything I've said previously applies, but in my opinion, there was an unacceptable amount of bosses that were repeated in the game. Um, the amount of ulcerated tree spirits I had to fight was just like, was just ridiculous. And even things like I just mentioned, the death right bird. I think what frustrated me the most was when I, I found a unique boss that I really liked and I thought this is such a great addition to the game I really enjoyed fighting this guy and I'm glad that they created something a bit more one-off and unique for this situation and then you find out that it's not and so like the first time that happened was Astor for example Astor was amazing it was one of my favorite bosses of, of the game and then it's like no there's a second Astor and this one's harder and it's more annoying and it has a grab attack where it multiplies itself into like 10 different versions and they all try to grab you and that just took away some of the shine of having Astor as a boss in the first place for me. So that happened. And then even for Deathrite Bird, yeah, sure. Like during the game experience, I, I loved it. But then I later found out there was three more that I just didn't meet. So I could have easily encountered like another two of them by accident. And then I'd be saying, oh, well, you know, the Deathrite Bird was good, but, they sh but having three of them was a bit much. So this is what I mean. There were the amount of bosses that got repeated in this game. Like you go to the end of a catacomb, and it's something you fought before, or like you go to the bottom of an Erd tree and it's something you fought before. Like, of course there's going to be repeats, it's a giant game, open world game, I get it. It's not, this doesn't, you don't have to immediately jump to the other side and say, oh, so you want every single boss to be unique? Fuck off. Like, no. I'm saying that you don't have to have the same boss maybe six times or eight times or whatever the hell some of them appeared as. Maybe have like twos and threes, but especially I think for some of the more like bigger showcase bosses like Astor, just have one man like just have one don't have two astles in my opinion so yeah that was i think one of the biggest issues uh it did reflect i think in some of the areas like some of the the catacombs and some of the like, internal areas especially it did feel like they were they recycled it a bit too much again you could of course counterpoint this by saying well all of those according to the law most likely are serving the same purpose so the, the fact that they would be designed the same and have the same look is is consistent with the world and the world building and the law and that kind of thing. And that's great. That's fine. Okay. Um, if that's enough for you to not care that most of the catacombs look exactly the same and they play exactly the same, that's fine. But I do think that when they did inject some variety into them, it really shone. But to me personally, it wasn't enough. There was still a, a, a bit too much repetition in the look and the feel and the atmosphere and the enemies and the style um, for the catacombs and for one or two of the other like geographical areas of the game. So if you ask me, I think um, I would have been perfectly fine with this game being 30% smaller because it's huge. Like if it didn't take 150 hours, it took me about 100 hours, 100, 110 hours to do everything that I did in this run. But in a game that was 30% smaller, but it was 30% more refined and had 30% less repetition of bosses and that kind of thing. So it took away one of the Astals. Maybe it only gave you two death right birds. Maybe there was only three ulcerated tree spirits in the whole game. Something like that. I personally think the game would have been better. Um, it didn't need to be this huge. Like It's great that it is and it did an absolutely all-time job of being this huge and still being this great. But if we're talking about like what I didn't enjoy and what I think could have been done a bit better... I do think they could have scaled it down a little bit and made it a little more refined with a little less repetition and I think that would have that would have served the game better. So I think my biggest my biggest criticism was 
um, that they did kind of overstretch, I think, a little bit in terms of the size and repetition for, for some of the, the aspects. So yeah, I think that's like my general thing about that. Just the, just the sheer amount of reskins, the amount of times you fight like the hero of Zamor, it, it was just, it was too much. Like I remember there was, there was there's literally multiple times where I meet a boss, I'm like, oh, this boss is so cool. And then after I've met them, sometimes a second time, sometimes a sixth time, like, oh man, like not, one of, not another one of these. Or I just don't comment on it at all, and I just I go through the motions of defeating the boss because I've already fought it three times already. So yeah, I think that's uh, that was one of the biggest problems. It, it even affects things like the soundtrack. Let's say you have like an epic boss theme, but if you have an epic boss theme, and then the same boss is used twice, like again Astor or like some some other like bigger boss that's used twice, you don't even like appreciate the music as much anymore because you, your brain is just like yeah I've been through this experience already. So it's just, I think it hurts too many other aspects when you involve um, that much repetition. So it's kind of a shame. I will say that every friend that I spoke to uh, about this, they also agreed that the repetition was too much. So I really don't think that that's a, that's a hot take. I think it's way more of a hot take if you think that the ulcerated tree spirit didn't get used too much in this game. So I, I'm, I think I'm firmly on the side of the majority here where there was a bit too much repetition of bosses in the game. Second thing I would say, uh, the platforming at times was really stupid. Um, apparently, like that's the Soulsborne way. Soulsborne is always a bit janky and difficult to do and that kind of thing. But I don't think, again, I, everything I've seen in this game, almost everything I've seen in this game, serves that core purpose of the big world and the exploration. But what doesn't serve that for me is when you make fall damage so high and so inconsistent and when you make like traversal on foot um, across like areas where you might have to climb or drop or move across, when you make that difficult and you make people die constantly as a result of that, I think that takes away from that philosophy and it doesn't serve it. And that's another reason why I personally feel like it's more open for, for criticism. If you had a much more kind of cramped, condensed, bloodborne kind of world, then maybe it makes a bit more sense. But this game is built so heavily on that idea of exploring. You literally get given a horse that can make double jumps to help you explore. But this same horse just sometimes dies from most ridiculous jumps or falls. And then by that same token, you'll remember in one of the Divine Towers, because the game necessitates that you go in that direction, your, your player character takes like a 200-foot fall and he's absolutely fine. But like out in the open world, you take a 50-foot fall and you're dead. And it's just like... To me, it just like, it, why does this have to be done the Soulsborne way? Like, this is one thing where, I mean, if you're deviating from the general Soulsborne formula by having an absolutely epic sized open world, then why do you have to ad adhere to, oh, well, this is the Soulsborne way, you know, to jumping onto beams is always shit in Soulsborne, so we're going to keep doing that now. And it's like, no, you, you don't really have to do that, man. Like, you can make it easier. And so. I will say that it wasn't like constantly through the whole game and I did give it credit where it was due. So for example, an area like the Hadig Tree could have been an absolute horror um, where you just keep falling to your death constantly because the branches are too thin, you keep slipping off and that didn't happen. So that deserves credit, but there were definitely some sections of the game where I was like, this is just ridiculous. Um, you die like five or ten times from fall damage in places where you really shouldn't. I'll, I'll also give it a pass for the frenzied flame ending that's just so unique uh, the platforming needed to, to get to the end of that i'll give that a pass too but um there were definitely some some portions of the game and you guys if you've watched the whole playthrough you'll definitely remember that it just felt too finicky it felt like the game just mechanically didn't give you the tools and the dexterity to traverse some of the bits that you should have been able to traverse a bit more easily and uh, and the full damage with um with torrent sometimes is a bit dumb too but you adjust to it, you definitely learn what you can and can't do a little bit better with time. But it is an aspect of the game that I do think could have been made a little bit better. And I think they kind of stuck to their roots a bit too much, um, even though the circumstances changed with this game. So that's another thing that did definitely annoy me a bit. So piggybacking off this point is another one that's of a similar vein, I think. Um, and that's to do with like NPCs and quest lines and the way the game kind of positions them the way that they can kind of disappear and you don't really know where they are again, the way that events can be influenced depending on when you meet them, 
can also sometimes be confusing. And so this is another one of those things where when I did start to mention some of this stuff, a common response I heard was, yeah, like, you know, that's that's how Soulsborne kind of NPCs and quest lines have always been. And it, it's another one that made me think, like, yeah, okay, I get it. But, again, if you are in a much more cramped and condensed world that's a bit more sandboxy, having, like, a, a quest line structure and, like, a philosophy of finding people and refinding them again in that world versus a world that's so freaking big that you can play it for 150 hours and never meet a bunch of NPCs. To me, that requires a bit of a, a tweak in, in how you design things. And I feel like maybe this game didn't have enough of a tweak um, in some of those aspects. So, um, for a start, I mean, when the game was first released, there was no way to track where NPCs were. And so you had to use, like, pen and paper and make notes, basically, of where you found NPCs. Otherwise, you would lose them because the game was just too big. And even on Twitter, I saw this where... Some people were, like, defending it and saying, well, you know, sometimes, you know, the game can't hold your hand. You've got to think for yourself, man. You know, so sometimes it requires this kind of stuff. I'm like, when the hell was the last time a game required you to keep, like, a notepad of where you met NPCs to, so that you can meet them again? Like, this isn't some kind of, this is how it was back in the day, guys. You know, all these new players these days, you're all being spoon-fed too much. It was just like... I don't know, it felt a bit pointless to me. Like, I get it, if, and if you think that was a cool way to do it, then good for you. But, like, I kind of thought it was a bit dumb. And, well, honestly, I feel kind of vindicated because, obviously, they did bring in the NPC tracker onto the map from patch 1.04 onwards, I believe. And so I was like, yeah, okay, that makes more sense. And so maybe if I hadn't already played for, like, 60 to 80 hours or whatever I did, maybe I would have tracked some quest lines a little bit better. Because um, I did try to make a bit of a note like while I was playing through like out of necessity, but it's just not really the same as having those NPCs kind of marked out. So I think that was a little bit silly. Um, again, due to the non-linear way that the game works and like the order in which you can do things, um, trying to kind of follow along with NPC quest lines and trying to find them and refine them was for me sometimes just like a, a bit too difficult and it wasn't intuitive enough. Like I had a tough time with um, with Blythe. And part of the reason I did was because Bly's location and the order of events changes depending on at what point of the run you actually trigger his quest line and find him. So let's say because I defeated the Bloodhound guy first before I ever even heard of Blythe, the story changed. And there's all these different variations. So even when I looked it up at the time, I was just struggling to find what to do or like where he was because people had approached him in different ways depending on how their run was going and there was no consensus and so yeah it does add a bit of individuality to it but again given the sheer scale of the world doing these quest lines in like an organic and efficient way just felt a bit too hard um so for, for me personally I, I didn't really like the way that they did um some of the the npc quest lines again it's a mix some of them were definitely much easier and more intuitive they would kind of tell you specifically where to go or what to do or where you could find them next then you had the map update so you could keep track of the NPCs. So, again, it wasn't like a, this was terrible throughout and it was all bad, but there were aspects of it that were definitely noticeable that I didn't really enjoy as much um, for that stuff. Overall, it, it felt either too easy to completely miss a quest line, uh, to trigger a quest line midway through, or to lose a quest line midway through and not find those people again. So, I mean, again, I, I do feel like that's kind of it does cater a bit to the choose your own kind of adventure style where it you can have a different experience with your npcs and your quest lines depending on how you play the game but i do feel like they needed to tie it together maybe a little bit more and yeah i did have a friend who basically ended up saying that they ended up making dark souls npc quest lines in elden ring kind of implying that they they transposed their philosophy from dark souls onto Elden Ring and again given the difference in like the the overall world and the way that they've structured the game in that sense maybe it doesn't transpose quite as well as it would have into uh, like a, a more classic kind of map for a Soulsborne game so yeah I mean I think it peaked with something like Garank and Malekith no one can tell me that that was good game design I literally looked this one up because I was like am I missing something have I have is there like a, a really cool aspect of this that actually does make a lot of sense and and someone came up with a theory of like oh uh, Farah Missoula is suspended in time therefore like the fact that even though 
you defeated Malekith, Garank is still there. That's the reason why that's the case. But I mean, that's just to me that was just a bullshit excuse. And I think people were saying that it's actually the Placidusax, the dragon that's suspended in time, and not Farah Missoula itself. But whatever the case may be, the fact that Garank was still alive in the Bestial Sanctum, I went to Farah Missoula, I meet this beast clergyman guy who looks a lot like Garank, I beat him, he transforms into Malekith, I beat Malekith, it's very clear that Garank equals beast clergyman equals Malekith. And then I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then I go back to the Bestial Sanctum, and Garank is still there. You can't tell me that's good, like, NPC questline design. It's just silly. You could have made him disappear once you defeat Malekith, or maybe you could make, like, Malekith inaccessible until you complete Garank's questline, and he says, oh, I've disappeared off to, to Farah Missoula or to wherever it might be. So that was just, like, one example. But there are definitely things like that within the questlines that I, I do think were, were a bit clunky and not as well implemented possibly a result of the game being this huge if the game was 30 percent smaller i do think they could have tightened up those npcs and those quest lines and made them a little more refined and uh, and more organically flowing and uh, and just generally better i think so yeah the npc quest lines were definitely a little bit more hit and miss than i would have liked right so now we come to the important bit about storytelling and this is one where i'm like this is not to do with the game's design or the game's philosophy or like anything technical or like game reviewerish. This is very purely just like a, a my experience with video games, my own personal taste versus what Elden Ring has tried to do. So I wouldn't take this as a criticism of a game. I would take this as more of like a, a clash in styles, I would say. But it's important to me, so I think it's definitely worth mentioning. Um, I still... The, I think the only thing that stopped me putting Elden Ring literally up there with the likes of a game like MGS3, The Last of Us, and even maybe Final Fantasy X at its absolute absolute apex would have been a storytelling style that suits my own personal taste more. I'm the kind of person that still, even though it comes with its own problems, like I mentioned earlier, I prefer to still have some kind of storytelling within the within the game itself and to have like that attachment to a character or to a group of characters and to feel that storytelling journey through the game that's just what appeals to me always has and always will and so Elden Ring's kind of method of this very minimalist storytelling where it looks like the kind of backdrop right now there's there's just dots everywhere there's dots everywhere some of them shine brighter than others some of them kind of clumped together to form like a, a rough visual of something but for me at least I can never quite connect them up in a satisfying way when I'm playing the game and it's only afterwards when people are a lot better at researching lore than myself or better at putting the pieces together while playing they all kind of come together in like a scholarly fashion and start to really figure it out and theorize about things and explain what is going on in this world and the history of it and how all of these dots are connected and they form this like beautiful picture by the end of it. And I do appreciate that. I, I do enjoy that. But for the experience of actually playing the game and how I feel when, I, when I'm playing and when I've reached the end, I just don't enjoy it. Like It's just not my style of storytelling. Like There's so many times where you'll meet an NPC or some dialogue will happen and I, I feel like I'm like this sort of, like, I don't know, homeless guy begging for begging for change. I'm just like, more. Just give me more. Like Because they can do it. I think they definitely can do it. And that's why it's not really a criticism of the game. It's like, I think they're, they're very capable of it. But this is just how they do it. And it, it is a, a part of it that just clashes with me. Because I do want to know more about Melina for example. I do want to know more about Radan and Melania's story. I don't want to have to read that through item descriptions. Like, When you've got 150 hours of content, you've got enough time to give people a bit more of like dialogue, a few more cutscenes here and there. Even like, if it's a 150 hour game, just give us like an hour's worth of cutscenes that somehow kind of explain or demonstrate some of these aspects a little bit more. And it's like, you know, it's not the Soulsborne way. I get it. Apparently, Sekiro kind of does this in a much more conventional way compared to the Soulsborne games, and that's why I'm definitely interested in playing Sekiro in the future. But I feel like for Elden Ring, that's something that would have elevated it a little bit more. Like there were just characters that seemed cool to me that I still just didn't get enough from. 
like the Rani quest line was definitely fun uh, with Blythe and then Celevis and those guys. And because of like the NPC kind of scattered nature and the way that the game is, is done, that quest line could take you tens of hours to complete and you get these kind of little scatterings of little dialogues where EG will tell you something and you'll be like, oh, that was cool. And then you won't get anything for another 10 hours while you're off doing other shit. Like, it just doesn't come together in an engaging way while I'm playing the game. Like, I'm not... I, I almost never find myself wanting to... wanting to find an NPC or go to an area because I'm so, like, curious about what's going to happen next in the story or, like, see what's going to happen to this NPC or that NPC. Like, it just doesn't... I don't get motivated pretty much at all by those aspects. And that, for me, is a shame. So... For me, like that was epitomized by the ending of the game. Like, you go on this entire journey, and I kept feeling like we kept, we were given like this thing where we want to become the Elden Lord. We're tarnished. We've returned to the lands between to claim the title of Elden Lord, and then you start to realize that there's there's obviously a lot more to it. There's different factions that want different things, but then, for me at least, I I had this constant feeling of I feel like I don't have enough information to know what I want from this. Like, what kind of Elden Lord do I want to be? Like, am I going to continue the Golden Order? Do I actually really want to burn the Earth Tree down? Um, am I actually going to help the people in the Volcano Manor? Um, like, who should I be siding with here? Am I going to serve Marika, or is Marika the bad guy? Like, when I start playing this stuff, I, like, the game will ask me a question, like an NPC will ask, like, oh, so do you want to serve the Volcano Manor? And I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, <laughs> the, the, too much of this stuff happens where I just don't feel like I have the information. And that's not necessarily because the information isn't there. The information is there. But me and the way pretty much m almost everyone I know plays these games, you are just not playing the game in a way where you are making like a really detailed analysis of every single thing that you find. And you've got like... You know, like those those detectives that have like those pins and strings connecting everything. You're like, oh yes, I completely understand everything that's going on in this story at every given point, and I know exactly the, what the weight of my decision is and what I want from the story and my motivations. Like, I think the vast majority of people don't play this game like that. And then you get to the ending, and you're like, okay, so you know, I defeated everything now. Even Radigan is dead, and this Elden Beast thing that popped out of. Okay, fine. Uh, so yeah, what now? And then. He literally just sits on the throne and is like, you are Elden Lord now. It's like a 15, 30 second cutscene and it's over. And it's like, I just played 150 hours, man. It's like, you, you've got to give me a bit more than that. Now, if your response to that, again, is just like, that's just Soulsborne, man. Like, you know, it is what it is. Then, yeah, that's fine. But that is basically the main reason why um, this game will always have a ceiling for how much I can love it compared to my absolute, absolute favorites of all time. So that's why when I was talking to people about, so Elden Ring 2, if they ever did do that, what could they change? I just wish that they could try something a bit different. I mean, if they did kind of deviate from their usual formula and give us this absolutely giant open world to play in, why not deviate some more? Just try to create maybe a bit more of a story that's actually told like within the game, not through like written item descriptions and, and shit like that. Like Maybe that's something that could be experimented with a little. I mean, apparently they did it a bit more with Sekiro. Why not with Elden Ring 2? I mean, it could be interesting. There were just so many times where I was just yearning for like a bit more of a a dialogue and a cutscene with like Melina and stuff. Or like I was hoping that Gideon would acknowledge something that happened in the game where like I've defeated something. Like I defeated... What was it? There was a guy that had like Gideon's eye on his armor or some shit. The eye of Gideon or whatever the hell it was. It was like something that directly referred to him. And then he just, he didn't say a single thing about it. Like, just too many times where I was like, come on, like, you don't have to give me a 15-minute cutscene about it, but just acknowledge that something happened so I can feel connected to something that I did in the game. And it just, it just didn't happen. So, I mean, that's one thing that, just on an absolutely personal level, I'd love to see them just try. Just try, man. J just see where it goes. Maybe it doesn't work so well. And people are like, eh, well, this isn't Soulsborne anymore. It's lost, it's lost the soul. But, um, but, who cares? You do it for one game, doesn't work, you go back to your roots, man. Like, because you, you gotta, you got to add some kind of innovation somewhere along the line. So, I don't know, like, where they even go from this game, that's something I've been thinking about a lot, because it's so huge and it's done so much and it's achieved so much. It's like, what do you even do? So you've got to create a brand new world that's of a similar scale, that looks just as pretty, that has 
and that's even better. Like, how do you even do that? I don't know. I'm interested to see. But yeah, a more satisfying story with a more satisfying payoff at the end where you are a bit more engaged to the story while you play and then at the end you don't just get slapped in the face with like a 20 second cutscene for like five of the six endings. I think that would be something that I personally would prefer. Okay, so time to talk about bosses. Now, uh, I think the first one, because it's, it's one of the ones that's most fresh in my mind, has got to be Melania. While I do think that Melania will go down as an iconic, like, historic boss in video games because of how difficult she is, I couldn't shake the feeling that that stupid thing that she heals even when she hits you with a shield, that just really pissed me off. And it was something that I couldn't really reconcile because she's basically, it's called life steal. So she's got to be stealing life from something. Um, the fact that she's basically plucking free health out of thin air, I thought was kind of bullshit. And it, it was a bit gimmicky and it did frustrate me. So that's something I definitely have to point out. Like if you are making a uh, like super, super, super difficult boss, trying to avoid tricks like that, I think is, is probably something that's, that's going to help make it feel just a little more fair. You can make something extremely tough while still making it very, very fair. And that was one aspect of it that like you couldn't tell me that that was fair. Like that was just not. And usually I wouldn't care as much, but because it is Melanian, it's supposed to be like the grandstand hardest boss it did it definitely did bug me i still think in general bosses are not programmed well enough when you have a second player one thing that just kept happening i think for me was that i just could not find you know how i talk about the you know you create your own challenge uh, in this game as well one way in which i think the game could make that easier for you is to change how the bosses aggro there were just too many times where basically the, the battle went from being 10 out of 10 difficult to 4 out of 10 difficult as soon as I summoned someone. And I didn't even do like online summons or anything. Or I didn't even summon any of the, the game's kind of AI NPC summons. This was just using like the Mimic tier or using like one of the other like, um, what's it called? Ash of War? Spirit of War? I keep forgetting what it's called. The, the basically the spirit summons. So... One thing I personally would have liked to see is that the main reason why it becomes so easy is because these bosses almost always focus on the summons too much and that leaves you free to just spam attacks and just to take them out. I think they need to find a way to make it so that the priority is almost always on you. And let's say instead of attacking, like if you keep your distance and your summon is basically doing the work and they're actually trying to attack and they're taking all of the aggro, it can sometimes be like, you can kind of just sit back and if you have something that has some range, you basically never get hit. And it's like 80, 90, 100% of the time, you're not having to dodge anything, you're not having to heal, and you can just sit back and watch while your summon tanks it. And so I feel like the game shouldn't let you do that. I feel like that's a bit too broken. Like maybe if you're playing online and the guys that come in, like, cause obviously the game can't control what those guys do then that's fine. Like, if you really are struggling, having people come in from online to help you win, I think that's that's perfectly reasonable. But I think when you summon, like, a Mimic tier, let's say, I feel like the difficulty still swings too much because the bosses are still too focused on the Mimic tier instead of the player who is the who should be the true threat and the true priority for the AI. So I feel like in a future game they should tweak that a little bit because... I just I couldn't find that balance between summoning my mimic tier and still having like a really tough intense battle versus like not summoning them and it's too hard sometimes. So I really would have liked to have had a couple more battles where well Moog and Melania are good examples where where when I did summon I still needed like 30, 40, 50 attempts to win even with my summon because I was still having to do a lot of the the heavy lifting when that happened. So yeah, Melania I think the lifesteal thing was a good way to kind of counteract the summons a little bit and that's why the, it still remained kind of difficult even with the summon but that was a pretty rare case and even then I, it didn't take that many attempts once i used the mimic tier uh, to be able to defeat her so that's one thing i think that could be done a little bit better in the future as well that spectrum of difficulty between going solo and summoning um, like a mimic tier or like one of the very good uh, spirit summons i think that that gap kind of needs to close a little bit personally. And again, I don't think relying on the player to always make every decision and to make 
and expecting them to make every call about how difficult their run is correctly is difficult because you could say, oh, well, then don't use a Mimic tier, use a different summon. And it's like, well, or like don't upgrade it as much. It's like, well, expecting to expecting the player to be like, oh, yeah, so when, when my Mimic tier is at plus six, they have the perfect amount of tankiness where they're not tanky enough to last the whole battle, so I still have to do 30% of it myself, which makes it just the amount of challenge that I was after. I, I think that's a bit too much. If you just kind of make a more global decision to have the boss focus a bit less on the Mimic tier and a bit more on the player, even when it's being attacked by the Mimic, then I think that's just a better way to balance it overall. So, so that's something I'd, I'd personally like to see because it still leaves the window open for if that made it too difficult for you, you've still got like online summons available and you can call people in. They're going to be very powerful and they're going to take those hits for you and be able to dispatch those bosses if you really need it still. So I don't think it's going to break the game in the other way, but it might help to, to find a bit more of that sweet spot because I do think for the hardest bosses, again, the majority of players that I spoke to dabbled with using the Mimic tier to help them win. And so clearly there was a bit of a kind of too big a gulf there. And I think once they did use their Mimic tier, I don't think anyone particularly struggled that much to defeat like a Moog or a Melania or anyone like that. So I think that middle ground was a little bit lost with the way the bosses are programmed. So for me, I think the final word about bosses is Radigan and Elden Ring. Now, among the best bosses, I didn't mention Radigan, but honestly, Radigan was a really cool boss, and I know a lot of people love Radigan as a boss. But overall, because he is used as a first form for the Elden Beast battle, overall, I have to be negative about it. I didn't like the fact that Radigan was kind of re relegated to being like this first form. And the fact that Radigan is already a difficult boss as a first form, he's basically a fully fledged boss. And that there's no save in between, and then you have to fight Elden Beast, who's of course one of the most difficult bosses of the entire game. Right at the end, after you've clearly, like most players have been playing the game for so long, I think it's a bit of a slap in the face. Like, there is no way, in my mind, that having Radigan be a little bit more difficult, but making him a singular boss, giving like a checkpoint afterwards, and then making Elden Beast his own thing, to me that would have made the battle better. The reason in the end I gave up and I used a summon against Elden Beast was because I'd had enough of fighting Radigan in the first form every time. And Elden Beast was obviously difficult and it had the stupid Elden Stars attack. And there was just so much bullshit going on there. Like the camera wasn't good. Um, of course, a lot of the time, like when you face these massive enemies, the camera just does not work that great. Um, and so when I, when I combined all those things, I was like, look, man, I've been at it for like 140 hours. I just don't have, I, don't, I didn't have the patience anymore to, to try to solo the final boss. And so I do think it definitely could have been done a little bit better. Um, it was a bit of a shame that it ended with, uh, with Radigan and Elden Beast in the way that it did. So that's definitely one thing I think that could have been done a bit better. Like, honestly, because of that kind of design, again, that's one boss where I'm not like, oh, I've really got to go back and solo Elden Beast. I just don't care. I just, uh, it wasn't, for me at least, that whole kind of finale boss-wise, I don't think it was quite implemented well enough. And maybe it was a little bit rushed at the end, who knows. I don't know, but yeah, it, it did. It didn't end with quite the bang that I was expecting with uh, with Elden Beast and uh, and Radigan. And once again, once I summoned Elden Beast, I think I only needed to summon twice, maybe twice, three times tops. So again, it became. It went from like I'm really, really struggling to solo this. It might take me a few more hours to I won in like two or three attempts when I summoned. So again, that middle ground was lost too. So I didn't quite again feel that euphoria and that satisfaction. Um, when I defeated Elden Beast. And that's the general, I think, that was the only difficulty-related issue that I had. Like, right at that upper, upper, upper echelon of difficulty, I didn't quite get that euphoric feeling from uh, Moog, Melania, or from Elden Beast because I couldn't do it solo. It was too difficult, um, especially after 130 to 150 hours of playing where I did want to start to wrap up the game and not spend collectively another 15, 20 hours trying to defeat them. Um, but then, obviously, when, once I did summon, I felt like because I already kind of did all of the work when I was soloing, I felt like I earned the win still. But it didn't give me that real, like, adrenaline buzz that I got from defeating, let's say, Orphan in Bloodborne. It, was, it wasn't on that kind of scale. And for a game that has so many bosses and that's still a FromSoft experience, I, I do feel like that was something that was, uh, was a little bit missing. But maybe that's something I'll try to, to correct in the future. We'll have to see.
so yeah that choose your own challenge aspect is definitely a blessing and a curse because what the game also does of course is that because it does give you so many of these options it is very easy to slip into like finding something that works brilliantly um, and then just spamming it for for a lot of the game like i spoke to someone recently who was like um what did they say they said they they naturally discovered a build that basically one-shotted almost everything and you guys would have heard of Comet Azure and stuff I'm sure this guy basically discovered how powerful it was and a way to strengthen it even further and not have it use any FP and so I think they basically just absolutely blasted through everything um, I had another friend who had a dual wield katana build dual bleed build um, they absolutely like destroyed a lot of the major bosses um, and they they specifically said to me, they said that ultimately they kind of regretted it a little bit because they didn't really get to have a proper experience. So, so like, for example, a boss that maybe took me, I don't know, 30 attempts to do and it was like an intense, like good battle, like Malaketh, let's say, was like a high level kind of good battle. If you If you were the kind of player that found a build and you leaned into it really heavily and you knew that it was basic, it could basically like make mincemeat of Malaketh, when you're talking to someone else and like, oh man, it was such an epic battle. Like it took me like two hours to do, it was so much fun. And they're like, oh, uh, I did it in like two attempts or three attempts or something. Rather than sounding like a flex, like normally to me that would sound like, I'd be like, oh my God, man, they're so skilled. I'm kind of jealous that, that they managed to defeat it so fast. They must be so good. When I hear something like that for Elden Ring, I almost feel sorry for them in a sense. It's almost like, oh man, you kind of missed out on like a really cool battle. I wish you had a build that was a bit more kind of a, a, an even match or like you were less leveled or like maybe you shouldn't have used the mimic tier for that one. You would have had a really good time. So it's interesting how that goes. Like with Bloodborne, if someone has said to me, oh, like I faced off against Orphan and I won like within 15 minutes, I'd be, I'd be jealous. I'd be like, fuck man, like that took me hours to do. That was so tough. Like you, you're clearly damn good at this game. But in Elden Ring, if someone says to me, oh, I beat Moog in like five tries, to me, rather than being like, oh my god, this guy is amazing at the game, my mind immediately goes to, oh, okay, so what build did you use? Uh, did you use, I don't know, did you use double bleed? Did you use a mimic tier? Like, my reaction to those kind of things shift. So that's kind of interesting with, with Elden Ring. And that's why I say it's a, it's a bit of a gift and a curse. Like, where that difficulty kind of lies is so dependent on your build and your playstyle that it's very hard to kind of equalize across it and so that's why it really is such a, a choose your own challenge so when people kind of do a poor job of choosing their own challenge and they really do find that broken build and at the time it kind of seems like it's satisfying but then they're like actually i kind of wish i didn't do that i kind of blasted through the game too easily and i missed out then those people are like maybe i should do a new game plus where i try a different build and make life harder for myself again and, uh, and blah 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 so it really is a blessing and a curse I've definitely I personally did have a few regrets when I was playing through and you guys saw me stop using uh, the mimic tier unless I absolutely had to or like using summons or whatever and uh, and stuff like that so I did have some of those regrets myself and I did speak to people who did use builds and use summons and do xyz where they were like oh I completely trashed a boss that should have really been difficult and I kind of end up regretting it a little bit. So that is a bit of a bit of an interesting aspect of the game too. And so, like I say, it is a it is a double-edged sword. But for my personal run, it didn't affect me enough for it to be like a genuine issue. But it is something that I was I was very conscious of all the time while I was playing. And uh, I'm kind of thankful that I did manage to, by and large, find um, like that that difficulty kind of level that I was looking for, barring those absolute upper echelons that I talked about before, where solo versus summoning I just, I just couldn't find what I needed and ended up um, kind of not having quite the experience I wanted in that situation I probably could have respect it into something that would have worked better potentially that could have been like the middle ground but again that requires like more knowledge more experimentation more research into finding like what build works best for Moog let's say uh, on a blind run you'd have to try a ton of different things to figure that out and again, when it's been that long into the game, you're just less motivated. And you've beaten everything up until Moog uh, without summoning for ages. Like, I spent a huge chunk of the game not summoning. Uh, I defeated Morgoth without it. I defeated Godfrey without it. I defeated Malekith without it. So I defeated, like, some very high-level bosses without the use of summons. So when I came to Moog, I was like, I should be good enough to do this. 
without having to get into constantly like trying to find a new build to beat him kind of thing. And so, yeah, part of that is my fault, but I do think the game kind of needed to, to give you a slight extra helping hand with some of those, especially most difficult bosses, with, uh, with finding that difficulty, I think. Because it, it did seem to be a bit of a, like, no one that I'd really talked to seemed to find the middle ground. Of the three or four people that I chatted to regularly, I don't think any of them soloed Moog or Melania. And so none of us ended up soloing. And depending on your build and how early you decide to use those summons, Moog might have only taken you like a few tries. You would have just got through. So I do think that that aspect of it is a little bit weaker compared to the rest of the overall experience. Time for me to start concluding things here. What I've decided to do is basically come back to the game later on to defeat Moog and Melania without using any summons. So I'm going to try to do the new game plus. And the reason I mention this, of course, is because there is going to hopefully be a couple more videos coming on the playlist where I defeat Moog and Melania without summoning. And I kind of redeem myself in my own mind for, for being able to do that. Obviously, you can defeat them whatever the hell way you want. It doesn't really matter. But for my own personal journey and story, I would love to try and defeat those guys without a Mimic tier. Uh, if possible. So I will go back to that. But it does bring me to another aspect. This game, because of everything I've mentioned so far, plus the new game plus ability, it really is the game that you could basically play for like 10 years and not get bored of it. If you've loved this game enough, the amount of variety and runs that you can do and the challenge runs and stuff that you can do, it is a game where the challenge community is going to be very strong and it's going to last for years. Like this game is going to live on. And that, again, to me, is a testament of a masterpiece. People will be talking about this game for a long time to come. There'll be lore videos coming for a long time to come. There'll be people thinking of new challenges to do for a long time to come. There's going to be DLC, I'm pretty sure. So in that sense, again, it's just so strong. And even for me, after spending 150 hours, I do want to go back to the game. Maybe in like a few months' time, potentially. But I do want to go back. Especially in this day and age for me, like the because of my workflow and the channel and all that kind of stuff. When I'm done with the game, I'm usually done. Like barring DLC, most games I probably won't play ever again because the backlog is so big and there's always new content to make that rather than spend another 30, 50, 80, 100, 150 hours playing an old game, I'd rather try to play something I never played before or maybe like my shorter all-time favorites. But this game, again, that's not the case. I do want to go into a new game plus and to try to defeat those guys with the same build that I had for the original run where I failed to do it. So, again, the sheer amount of value that you get from this game and the community that you get from this game, the replayability that you get from this game, is second to none. And that's another reason why I'm sure it's sold so well and will continue to sell so well as well. Like The sheer value proposition of Elden Ring, if you've enjoyed it, is absolutely immense. There's just It's just a never-ending world of, of gameplay and lore and community that you can lose yourself in for years to come. So just an absolutely phenomenal experience and uh, like like very few things I've ever played in my life. It really is. It stands alone in many ways. Um, I'm so, so glad that I played it at launch. It made it way more memorable for me to, to share it with my friends and, uh, and to see the response from you guys as well. Yes, I don't read the comment sections anymore. It's no secret. But I have spoken to so many people like on the 24-7 stream People DM me on Instagram about like certain things they've seen in the playlist that they want to talk about. I've had like endless talks and discussions with people about the game. So I'm definitely still connected to it, even if I don't read the comment section for like 200 episodes. But the general feedback for the game has, of course, been positive. There's always going to be like the, the kind of gatekeeper-y, toxic, negative sides of, of the community. There always is. And for Elden Ring, I'm sure that's strong too, because... Everyone thinks that they, they have the best play style or they know the most about the game or they know the way the game should be played or shouldn't be played or whatever it might be. But for me, I've managed to keep away from all that stuff. So it's been overwhelmingly positive for me. Um, I've only ever had positive interactions and experiences with the game. And so that's something that's made it even more special for me. So I've literally had people kind of message me about like saying like, oh, you know, some of the comment sections that stuff is so frustrating and so annoying. And I just generally reply, like, what comments with a, with a winky face? Because it's just like, I just don't let myself get caught up in that stuff anymore. And if you're one of these people that supports the channel and you enjoy the gameplay and you find it entertaining, even if you see stuff that I'm not doing as well or that you're not enjoying as much or that's frustrating for you, 
if your general attitude towards the, the channel and the playlist and the content is positive, don't let yourselves get bogged down by the negativity that you see in the comments. Try to do as I do, just, just ignore it. Just enjoy it for what it is. This is an entertainment channel. I play games and I share my experiences with you guys. It's not really deeper than that. So don't let yourself get too worked up about it. I've literally had people get frustrated like, and angry on my behalf. I'm like, I did that for like 12, 13 years. And after that amount of time, I decided to just step away and to just focus on the people that want to interact with me in a more positive way and dedicate my time and my energy in a more positive way instead of trying to read and respond to and explain myself to people who want to be negative and want to be mean and want to be toxic. They're not worth my time and they're most certainly not worth yours. So just enjoy yourselves. Don't worry too much about the comment sections. If you have something positive and something kind to say, that's cool. Or if there's something that you've seen me do or that you've seen me annotate that's wrong or that could help other players if you explain it a different way, then sure thing, help people out with it. But just uh, life is short, man. Just don't waste your time on, on these kinds of things and these kinds of people. Just try to spread positivity and love within the community because we're just here to have fun and we're here to entertain and that should be all that matters. So yeah, it's been an extremely long video, but that's not a surprise. Um, this game was just too big for me to, to kind of wrap up in like 10, 15 minutes. If you've spent a hundred and however many hours watching the series, I'm sure, I'm sure you're interested in this uh, final kind of ramble to, to talk about everything. I can't thank you guys enough. I mean, because I've I'm known so much for Fire Fantasy content. Um, I have done a series of this length before, but that was Fire Fantasy X, and that took over two years to upload the entire playlist um, for a game that took this long. Uh, and given my workflow, I've actually been pretty quick. <laughs> Um, I, I had to end up resorting to like longer episodes uh, towards the end because I stopped LPing. Uh, I didn't have anything to record for a while and that meant I could really crunch out the editing. Uh, it won't be like a regular thing. I won't be making like 45 to 60 minute episodes for everything that I do from now on. But this was a unique scenario where the game was so huge and I needed to get it done and out of the way before like the big winter title started to come along that I really started to work like overtime on this one to make sure it got completed. So, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for all of the time that you invested into this series. It's It's been an absolute pleasure. It's, one, it's become one of my favorite games of all time. So you guys end up getting to watch an experience that ends up being one of my favorites on, on the channel ever. So despite the incredible length, I really do hope that you guys had a really good time with it. I appreciate everyone's support, even like a long time after the series started. The numbers were still very healthy for each new episode, given that it's not Final Fantasy content. So I, I just can't thank you guys enough. It's, it's been a real pleasure to play through this game. And I hope you guys have enjoyed watching as much as I have enjoyed playing. Massive shout out to everyone on Patreon and the channel members. Again, especially for these massive series like this that take up so much of my time as a full-time content creator. You guys really help to make sure everything keeps rolling on the channel. And it's a massive help and a boost to the channel. And of course, you guys get perks too in return for your support. So as always, if you are interested in that kind of thing, I would kindly request you to check out the Patreon and the channel membership and see if any of the perks appeal to you and you want to support the channel in an above and beyond kind of way. So I am signing off for now. I will hopefully have two more videos in the future where if you were watching me fight Moga and Melania and you were kind of a bit bummed out that I'd never managed to do it solo, then you'll get to see the redemption, hopefully, and uh, enjoy me overcoming those guys and kind of proving to myself that, that I can do it without having to summon. So hopefully that's still to come. And then in the, f in the future, we will most likely have DLC. And so we'll be journeying again soon. But for now, it's goodbye from me after 150 hours of one of the greatest games I've ever played. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I will see you soon. Take care.